Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to this service this morning. For those that are here in the sanctuary that Roger just said, well, it's Labor Day part two and we're glad that uh, you are here. So a lot of people that didn't have a place to go last week, they went this week. And so uh, someday we'll all get together. If you have not already done so, will you detach and sign the registration of attendance slip and uh, we'll have a record of your attendance here today. If you are worshiping online, welcome to you. And will you please use, if you are on Facebook Live, then use the comment section to let us know that you are worshiping with us. Please read the back of the bulletin. There are several uh, announcements in the calendar there. The card crew will be meeting this week, uh, Tuesday at 10 o'clock. And then next Sunday, we do have a full Sunday, which will include luncheon after church. Along with that luncheon, the congregation will receive the report of the, uh, the mission study report and then go to a little friendly competitive bingo. Uh, there is a form in your bulletin that, uh, and this looks like the form that was in here before, and you say, well, wait a minute, the PNC was elected. Why do you have this in here again? Well, it's been reworded. Now we're looking for those who might be members of the session. So the Congregational uh, Officer Nominating Committee is going back to work, and so we would welcome your suggestions for any that you feel would be uh, uh, useful as an elder. Uh, Andy, we've got to uh, come over here near something that will amplify you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mary and I are thrilled to be back with you this morning. Uh, we've definitely missed you a lot. Um, and I'd like to make a brief announcement. As many of you recall, October is the month we do the annual ALS walk. It's the Dallas Walk to Defeat ALS. The purpose of the walk is to raise awareness and money for funding to hopefully find a cure for ALS. Many of you know my father suffered from ALS and the support of this church family meant so much and still means so much to us today. The date is coming up soon. It's a month earlier than normal. It's October 1st. It's only a couple weeks. We're really excited if you'd like to join our team and walk with us that Saturday morning. It'll be a lot of fun. It's in Irving this year at one of the Dallas uh, colleges. Uh, uh, approach Mary or myself. Just contact us for more details. And again, appreciate uh, any help that you can give. And we look forward to walking with you. Thanks. 
Today in worship, there will be a children's time. We are not having godly play today because those the sauciers are out of town. But beginning next week, we will have something in every service for children fifth grade and younger after the uh, passing of the peace of the children's time, depending on what Sunday it is. So we will look forward to that. We come together today as we do each week to once again seek to connect with God. Uh, seek to understand what God has in mind for us and for the world. God has given us as a part of humanity moral freedom and choice and yet we are not left without guidance. Today is September 11th, 9-11 to 2022. It is the 21st anniversary of a blatant misuse of moral freedom. 2,977 people who bore no direct responsibility for the grievances the perpetrators had were killed in the attack at the Twin Towers. And there was incomprehensible suffering and sorrow for many more. Since that day, 743 people who bore no direct responsibility to whatever grievances the perpetrators had have been killed in mass shootings, which has brought incomprehensible suffering and sorrow to many more. The news today carries the ongoing reporting of what Pope Francis described as Russia's repugnant war in Ukraine, where people who have no direct responsibility for whatever grievances the perpetrators have are being killed daily. We have no account of the number of those killed, but there is incomprehensible suffering and sorrow. As part of it, a nuclear power plant may be on the verge of meltdown. That would cause incomprehensible suffering and sorrow to the region, to Europe, and maybe to the planet itself. The other major story today is the death of Queen Elizabeth, who for 70 years gave her life in selfless devotion to leading her people. What a contrast. We see in one remarkable life that remarkable contrast and the intriguing possibilities of a life well lived. God has not left us without moral example or guidance. So once again, we come together to seek to connect with God, to understand what God has in mind for us and for the world. And this coming together is neither old fashioned nor is it outmoded as a quest. In fact, today, with all of the things in the news, it seems more relevant than ever. So let us begin that quest as we stand to sing hymn number 32, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. <laughs>
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. that is ours in Christ Jesus. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. God, God of grace, grace, love, and communion, we, we confess, confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. Have mercy on us. Do not fear, say to the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God is doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Well, come join me up here.
It's comfortable for a kid. It wouldn't be comfortable for me. I'll guarantee you. I wonder, have any of y'all, have you ever been lost? No, no, no. Y'all have been lost. Where were you lost? Uh, at a camp. At a camp. That's, that can happen at camps, because I'm going to tell you a, a, a story about that in, in just a minute. But now, when I came, when you all came in today, your daddy was looking around and he was counting kids. He was making sure that you all weren't lost. And I have an idea that uh, with you all running around that maybe he has to do that every once in a while. Well. I wasn't at a camp, but I was on vacation with my parents, and we were in Garner State Park on the Rio Frio, which just means a cold river. And uh, I decided. I like the cold river. You like a cold river. Well, and after the summer <laughs> we've had, that. We're probably going to go swimming at the pool Are you? Okay. Well, and hopefully that's going to help. The heat isn't so bad today, but it's still nice to deal with it. Well, uh, anyway, I started. I got out and I thought, well, I'll just wander off down here. Now, I want you to understand, I can get lost between here and that street out there. I am, uh, I, I'm not very good with directions. And so I started wandering first along the river and then I wandered off. And after a while, I realized that nothing looked familiar and I didn't know where I was. And I, I was lost. Now, I know now that if I had gone back to the river and just walked in the opposite direction, I would have gotten back, except I'm not sure what was the opposite direction. But just about the time that I felt like, oh, I'm never going to see civilization again, I heard a familiar voice, and it was my dad. And he did, like your dad, he came, he didn't have to count, but he came looking for me. and. Uh, he found me and I looked at when I saw him coming because, see, he missed me and he went out to find me. We're going to read a story in the Bible today uh, just about uh, a shepherd that does that who's got a bunch of sheep and they, he goes out and one of the sheep doesn't get home. Uh, and so he goes out looking be eaten for the by sheep. A wolf. It could be eaten by a wolf, you bet, or it could fall oh, in a, it could fall off a, a cliff. cliff, or it could fall off something. So the shepherd goes out and finds the sheep. He leaves 99 sheep and goes out looking for the one, because that sheep is important. Well, Jesus told that story to remind us that that's what God is like, that God is always out wherever we're out wandering, and we are. God goes out looking for us because it doesn't many matter how many are back in the fold. God is always looking for the lost sheep. Just like when you told us about when he was in our backpack, those sort of kind of... God is with you, yes. You're carrying him in your backpack, but you are also that if you are lost sometime, that God knows where you are and God cares about you and God's always looking for you. And so I want you to remember this week that wherever you are, you're never, never alone. You're never out of God's sight. We pray with me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for coming to find us when we're lost, when we're silly, when we're foolish, but we know we're always in your sight. We give you thanks for that. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. We have a running feud, whether it's amen or amen, but it can be whatever you want it to be. Okay. Starting next week, y'all will have a place to go now, but right now, go back to your parents. And we'll see you after a while. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Thank you. That was beautiful. Please join me for a prayer for illumination. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then we may respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our readings today from Exodus 32, 7 through 14, verses 7 through 14. You're welcome to follow if, if you wish in your pew Bibles. We will follow that with a reading from Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. How stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may not burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your face, fierce wrath, change your mind, do not bring disaster to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, Israel, and your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like stars of the heaven and all of this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Luke tells us, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there may be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of the Lord.
occasionally we human beings rise above the banalities of our own imagination to try to comprehend the greatness of God. We began this service singing, I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad, and filled the lofty skies. Oh, some of us may have sung it with little enthusiasm or understanding, but the imagery was right there before us. And there's another that maybe we'll learn someday that expands our imagination a little further. And its words begin, when the morning stars together their creator's glory sang and the angel host all shouted till the joy of heavens rang. This is how so-called traditional hymnody expresses it. But there are counterparts to that same expression in some of the so-called praise choruses. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. In fact, that one has now just become a traditional song. My purpose in going through these ramblings is to get about talking about two stories that Jesus told, which are recorded in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. But first, we need to set things up. About the middle of the 20th century, a man named J.B. Phillips wrote a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. He explored some of the unworthy concepts that human beings have concerning God. Most people construct an image of God that is confined to the limits of their imagination. Some ignore the revelation of scripture and shun the collective experience, which is what the church is. Many times our understanding of God is self-constructed, and we're more like the little girl in the story that went around a few years ago. I'm referring to one about the kindergarten class whose assignment was to draw a picture. One little girl was drawing so furiously that the teacher was curious and went over to see what it was all about. She asked the little girl what she was drawing, and the girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl said, well, they will when I finish this picture. <laughs> And that fuzzy image is all, in all likelihood, of a God that is most likely too small, which may be nothing more than a compilation of rumors and even prejudices. Of course, there are others who glean what they can from scripture and Christian tradition, and they imagine that with these aids, they have found an infallible and in irrefutable word about and concept of God, the complete word, the only word, the last word. Of course, there are at least two problems with that. We are sometimes rather uh, selective about what attributes of God that we glean from the Bible. And we forget the limita limitations of the human mind to get hold of an awesome God. So J.B. Phillips was right. Often our God is too small. There are limitations to personal experience as our final authority. When we sing something uh, like the opening line of that hymn I referred to earlier, when the morning stars together their creator's glory sang, we began to take on a proper image of God who is really beyond all comprehension. And that gladness doesn't, that greatness doesn't have to be all that intimidating. We live with it all around us. 
You talk about the stars. You may remember that the light from some of the stars that we see comes from a source so far away that its light left the star about the time Christopher Columbus set sail for America. It has traveled 186,000 miles a second to reach us today. You really can't comprehend a distance like that. And yet there is something in the vastness of creation that joins together, that joined us a while ago to sing God's praise. Now, Christians have staked their faith on the proposition that Jesus the Christ is the fullness of the revelation of God. That is to say, in him we see a piece of the nature of God that we can wrap our finite minds around. And just like seeing the tip of an iceberg whose mass is mostly hidden, what we see of God, uh, what we can see is consistent with the rest that we cannot see. Now, if you've hung in with that so far, let's look at these parables in Luke and what occasioned them. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. <laughs> For the Pharisees and the scribes, some of the most religious people of the day and their modern counterparts, the essence of obeying God includes dividing people into groups, right and wrong, good and evil, acceptable and unacceptable. For them, part of our responsibility is to determine who's in and who's out. People must earn a place in our company and in our affection. And if they do not meet up to our standards, then they must be shunned. Religious people like this come to such a conclusion and style of behavior because of their own comprehension of God. For them, love will always have conditions attached to it. Have you ever dealt with anybody like that? Those who seem to believe that we can have a relationship or a friendship only if we see things in exactly the same way. Only if you do not live up to my standards, then you cannot share my company. We can get along only if you think and act in a particular way. In other words, I'll love you if and their God is pretty much shaped like their own personality. That crowd that Jesus was talking to included some very narrow religious people, so he told them a couple of parables. He actually told three parables. We read two of them today, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. Each of them have their own nuances, but all of them have a couple of ideas in common. So let's just concentrate on the parable of the lost sheep. The proposition is simple. You have a hundred sheep. One of them has been lost. Now that's not a bad average. You've retained 99%, well, or only 1% has gone missing. Why not just write that one off as a capital loss? Well, for the sheep herder, that sheep was not just 1%. It's a living thing. It has a name. So you go out and you look until you find it and you bring it back home. You see, there's something to remember here about all humanity. As the Apostle Paul put it, and as we often use in our call to confession as we did today, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, when you read this parable of the lost sheep out in church, there may be a sense of 
righteousness that just falls over us. And we bask in the mercy of God. And we say, well, we serve a good and loving God. I'll just huddle here with the other 98 while God, the good shepherd, goes out looking. This parable, which is a hypothetical story, is based upon something that often actually happened. Now, this wouldn't be a one-time event. The shepherd might go out looking for a lost sheep on any day, but it was not always the same sheep. What I'm getting at is sometimes that lost sheep has been, is, or will be you or me. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is not difficult to rationalize why the lost sheep doesn't deserve much attention when we imagine that we're not the sheep that's lost. Oh, by the way, the same thing holds true if we're not hungry or we're not without health care or we're not homeless or without a job not the victim of a dysfunctional family, not reeling over a loss, not the one in the middle of war or sending a loved one off to war. But to the case in point, these grumbling Pharisees and uh, scribes uh, probably uh, thought themselves to be righteous enough that God congratulated himself on such a flawless creation. We're told that the Jews of Jesus' day had a saying. There will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. Well, when we believe that sinner is someone else, then that might seem the way it ought to be. But what if the sinner is me. While we may grudgingly admit that we're not perfect, we may also believe that whatever our deficiency, it's a minor one. Others are so much worse. A court ordered attorney was assigned to a client accused of criminal, criminal trespass. The attorney probed his client with some general questions about his background, and he asked the man if he had any previous arrests or convictions. The man answered, well, yes, I'm afraid I've had quite a few. The third attorney then asked, were any of them felonies? And the client indignantly replied, no, sir, I specialize in misdemeanors. Well, don't most of us assume that our sins, whatever they may be, are misdemeanors? The Pharisees of all generations uh, assume that if they're not sinless, their wrongs are minor. But we have to ask, is it a misdemeanor to put on a facade of respectability and even piety and yet miss the very essence of the nature of God and the life that God calls us to live? The reason it's not difficult to become one of the lost sheep is that like the sheep, we are inclined to be followers. We're often disposed to mold ourselves uh, into the shape of the environment around us without really giving it much thought. Uh, a new school teacher in a farming community asked her class, there were 12 sheep in a field and one jumped over the fence. How many were left? And one boy in the class spoke up and said, none. And the teacher said, you don't know your arithmetic. The boy replied, I may not, but I know my sheep. <laughs> sheep are followers. And sometimes they aren't too wise about whom they follow. That sort of reminds you of people, doesn't it? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But... 
here it comes. The good news of the parable is a vision of a God that is beyond all comprehension. Not in size, but in character. He goes after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. Remember the scribes and the Pharisees said there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. They saw God as, and they saw themselves in the role of punishment and vengeance. Jesus turned that around as he did many of the misunderstandings of the Pharisees. And he said, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. A little sarcasm there. Of course, that doesn't mean that God prefers the sinner over the righteous. It's just that God must be frustrated with the righteous who do not recognize their own sin. The hymn writer summed it up, for the love of God is broader than the measure of the mind and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. The insight we have into the awesome God who receives the adulation of even the stars is also the kind God that knows us by name, who even seeks us when we're lost until he finds us and brings us home. In a niche in the upstairs sitting room at my house, there stands an antique trunk People who notice such things have commented on the trunk's quality and condition. The trunk was originally a gift that had been purchased at first Monday in Canton. It was fairly rough when I received it, but it was old and you make allowance for such. But a couple of my cousins were uh, visiting me and they took notice of my humble ragged trunk. And so, as a Christmas present, they proposed to restore the trunk. They took it home. They patched and smoothed the rough surfaces. They replaced the handles, and they expertly refinished it, covering the inner tray with wallpaper and lining the inside with cloth. When I got it back at Christmas, it looked better than new. Not only was it in good repair, but it still had the character that only age and usage can give. Well, here's the point. What can happen to a trunk can happen to you or me as individuals. It can happen to a society. It can happen to the world. The God who is revealed to us through Jesus Christ is the kindly shepherd who searches the rough hills at twilight until even you and I are home safe. And then, if we'll just let him, he can patch us up, smooth the rough edges, and refinish us better than new. That is a God who is indeed beyond all comprehension. And that is a God who bids those who have been found to go out in his name and do likewise. Thanks be to God. Will you now stand as we reaffirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? Didn't have room to print the words, so it's in the hymnal at the front on page 35 if you need them. But here are the words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me in this call to prayer. power has created worlds and universes beyond our comprehension. Today we remember with all your love for us and your power to change us, which is indeed beyond all comprehension. We pray your cleansing and transforming power upon your church and its leaders so that we may become a transforming force in demonstration of your great love. Stiffen our resolve to discover in even greater ways your will for humanity as it has been revealed through Jesus Christ. We pray for a world that is tested and ravaged by forces of an abused national natural order, as well as human ignorance and greed. We pray for those who suffer extreme heat, fearful drought, ongoing viruses, as well as those caught in the misadventure of pernicious war. Grant through your spirit a moral awakening and a love for reason on the part of the leaders of the world. God of peace, we are reminded daily of the deep divisions within our own nation. Give us a quest for a nation that works for liberty and justice for all a love of truth and a zeal for national good that goes beyond slogans and symbols. Let the quality of life and common good of its citizens be the driving force among those we have elected to govern us. We pray for people who deal with disease, with loss, with loneliness, for those anticipating surgical procedure and those recovering from it. Lord, you give a special calling to those who act as agents of your healing and care. Encourage them and give them leadership and energy for their daily tasks. 
Lord, on a day when our own nation remembers with sorrow misguided human destructiveness, we also remember with thanksgiving the self-giving and life-giving devotion of Queen Elizabeth to her nation of Great Britain, whose citizens mourn her loss today. As you have taken her to yourself, give solace to her family, to the people of Great Britain, and to all who feel a connection and heritage that fell under the sphere of her leadership. We pray your guidance upon King Charles III and all who assume new duties of leadership in the wake of her absence. These and all other prayers you would have us offer we bring into the presence of your great mercy and your transforming power. For we pray these things through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Almighty and merciful God, from whom comes all that is good, we praise you for your mercies, for your goodness that has created us, your grace that has sustained us, your discipline that has corrected us, your patience that has borne with us, and your love that has redeemed us. Help us to love you and to be thankful for all your gifts by serving you and delighting to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, 450, Be Thou My Vision.
something about a God that's beyond all comprehension, but let your lives reflect that as you go out there so that others may be led to him. We'll see you next week. Have a good week.